Hello, we are back for the last segment of APL is New York. Uh, we've been talking about APL-led uh, regulations for over the last two days on the business side and the technical side. And now it's time to talk about the present and the future of APIs and regulation and standards uh, in the main track. So uh, I'm really glad to be back emceeing the main track. I will even present at some point uh, a study we made recently. But now it's time to um, invite David O'Neill from API Metrics uh, about like reaching common agreement on standards. So David is the CEO of API Metrics. Hello, David, how are you? Hi, Mehdi, how are you doing? I'm doing really fine. So you're from Seattle and you will tell us your story about like reaching uh, a common agreement on standards, right? Absolutely, uh, I will try to. Um, mostly I'm going to talk about trust, but it's, it's essentially the same thing. It's the same thing. So yeah, the stage is yours for 20 minutes, see you. Excellent, I'll, I'll try and rush through it without uh, speaking too quickly. Hi everybody, I'm David O'Neill. I'm the CEO and co-founder of a company called API Metrics, and we do provide monitoring and related services in heavily regulated API sectors like banking. But I want to talk about a little bit about the future and where we're going, and on the talk about the concept of trust within API frameworks and the API ecosystem in general. So trust, it's a noun. Uh, it means to have assurance or reliance on the character of somebody or something. And what I'm going to cover is how trust applies to APIs in regulated ecosystems, how we measure that, and how we gain trust over those measurements, and how we maintain that trust over time. We've been working with banks in the United Kingdom. Um, so despite my accent, I live in Seattle, but I am originally from England. They're way ahead of most countries on financial services regulation. And this is something that's starting to really bite for them, which is how do you how do you agree on how everything works? And that's what I want to touch on and talk about and introduce some concepts that uh, I think are important for this. So famously, Mark Andreessen said, software is eating the world. And Ron Miller from TechCrunch followed that up with, but it's the APIs that are doing, this, doing it. And that's very true. APIs are the way software is taking everything over. And the way we look at that is really the world of everything at the moment. APIs have grown up. And being grown up has started to mean regulators and others have paid, started paying attention to them. The most obvious of this is open banking. Many, many of the G20 countries and even beyond are taking a very big focus in uh, how APIs are delivered, how they're measured, what the quality of them is. But we're seeing the same movements in healthcare with the fire standard, with open government, and much more. So to start to talk about trust and some of the concepts around this, I'm going to talk about the API ecosystem as if it was a restaurant. Um, it's something I've been thinking about and talking to Kin Lane a lot about over the last uh, the last few months, and I think it's a good uh, it's a good example we can use for understanding who the different personas are and how they apply to the different ecosystems. So if I look at the restaurant ecosystem, we've got sort of three different groups of stakeholders in this. We have the kitchen staff; um, they're responsible for being skilled enough to deliver meals, work off recipes. Um, they're supported by washing up staff, cleaning staff. They have supplies in terms of heat, light, food, refrigeration, and so on. And they deliver things to the front of house. So you've got wait staff, hosts, customers, people who deliver the meals, clean the tables, eat the meals, uh, manage the business often, take the payments, and so on. But they're separated from the, the people in the kitchen. And then outside of that, you've got a range of different organizations and bodies and individuals who have an interest in the restaurant, but aren't necessarily ever going there or even or taking much interest in it day to day. And that could be facilities oversight, the fire inspector, um, review uh, reviewers reviewing on the quality, um, critics, um, and the suppliers who provide the food, the cutlery, the drinks, and so on. I actually think this maps quite nicely to the API ecosystem where we have technical uh, technical staff, the developers who are implementing technical standards, taking technology stacks, tooling, monitoring, and supporting that, and then getting it out to their consumers who may be other technology companies, but they're interested in what it is they bought, what the contract says, uh, accurate performance information, how do they find out about it, how do they use it. And they, more often than not, are now being overseen by 
teams looking at compliance. So standards development, continuous compliance analysis, accurate and meaningful reporting for external bodies, and people looking at dispute resolution or having to um, arbitrate between two parties in a dispute. And we've got different personas um, we can talk about in that. So on the technical side, we have organizations like FDX in North America with the open banking standards there, OB UK in the UK, providing the implement implementation standards for API specifications. FAPI, OpenID, FIRE, um, things that technical teams and developers take and put out as APIs. And then on the compliance side, you've got um, regulatory bodies, the ACCC in Australia and the Australian Treasury, the Financial Conduct Authority in Britain, um, the PSD2 regulations from the European Commission. But between that, there is something of a I call it the trust gap between the organizations defining the standards and how you'll be compliant to them and the all groups and entities delivering to those standards for people to consume them. And I'm not sure that we really have filled that yet. So I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about what those, uh, what comes into the trust gap, what the barriers to trust are, and uh, I'll try and keep it as light as possible. Um, so there might be some jokes. So. Let's talk about some barriers to trust. Um, I'll start with a restaurant example and then tie it back to what I, how I see it works with the API ecosystem. And the first of barriers to trust is an alignment of expectations. Um, so, for example, you go, you invite your better half or your other half or partner or a date out for a meal, and they think they're going to a Michelin three-star restaurant, and you take them to McDonald's. Um, you're not going to have the experience that the other parties wanted. Um, there is a mismatch of expectations there, in fact. And honestly, uh, please try it with your, uh, with your partner or a date. Uh, I know somebody, if you're married, who does deal in divorces. It's something that's likely to lead to unhappiness on both sides. Um, this is something that definitely is present in a lot of the API contracts we see and we work on. And it's something to be aware of. And we're going to talk a little bit about how, ways to avoid that. Next set of, er uh, of barriers to trust, I think, I call them parallax errors. So parallax is a, it's a scientific uh, consideration for how you look at measurements. So if you look at a thermometer, for example, from one angle, you can see a very different temperature to another angle. Um, in the restaurant sense, this is going back to my McDonald's example, the difference between a, uh, a box of McDonald's fries and some triple cooked tri chips from a high end restaurant. Um, they're both fries, they're both uh, fried potato product, but the experience of eating them can be very different. Um, so despite the fact you're essentially, in theory, looking at the same thing, what you get and what your experience of it is are completely different things. And this will come on, uh, we'll talk about this in terms of measurement with APIs. It's a very similar concept that you can be looking at the same thing from different perspectives and have very different outcomes from that. The next class I, I would call simple confusion or just error, um, a disagreement over what you ordered or what you did. Uh, I used to work in Paris and every summer tourists would come and order uh, the famous dish steak tartare, which is essentially raw ground beef with an egg, raw egg. And pretty much every time I'd be in a restaurant and a tourist ordered that, they wouldn't understand why they had raw hamburger. And it's it's not the fault of either, either party, really. They just didn't understand what they were ordering, and it wasn't what they expected. They saw steak. They didn't realize what the tartare was. And that's something that really um, comes through in regulations. What have you regulated? What does it say? What do both parties on either side of the contract really believe you're saying with that? And what are you delivering and what are you expecting to have delivered to you? And that comes to the heart of regulated APIs and how APIs will work, work on that. So let's, let's talk a little bit about the API equivalence of that. So I'll start with documentation. Um, we see this all the time, particularly with um, the very regulated APIs. Um, you'll have a specification. Let's take something like Open Banking UK. It's very detailed. It's very correct. But the implementation is left to the providers and the trusted third parties, TPPs. And that can lead to errors and just general problems. You can have too much documentation, so it's very hard to work out where you're at. Some providers provide too little. 
Some of the documentation on how to implement it can just be plain wrong. And this can be hugely painful for people implementing what in theory is a very well-defined specification that's always the same every time. The fact is you can look at somebody's documentation for doing the same security call, the same transaction, and end up with something that works first time out of the box for one provider, but doesn't work at all for another. Um, we can find it's incomplete. We can find it's not kept up to date. Um, it's also 2020, and we'll still find people who've printed their documentation to PDF format, and you have to download a PDF, and then potentially copy and paste bits from a PDF into uh, your development environment with all of the associated um, character encoding errors and other things that can happen. So while it's human error, it's vitally important that we agree on what is documented, how it's documented, and how that feeds through into the technical standards that govern the regulated APIs. Um, we're working with the open API specification on, for example, bringing into the specification better ways of handling secure, secure APIs and how to handle orchestrated workflows in a, a way everybody can agree on. And it's sometimes quite surprising to people that after all these years of using APIs, the specifications are still behind, but that's something we'll come on to in a bit. Um, we then talk, have barriers to entry. Um, these can be regulatory. You can't just uh, turn up and say, I have a bank, I want to use a banking API. You often have to prove either to the bank individually in bipartisan agreements, or to a central regulating authority like OBUK in the UK, that you're allowed and are qualified to have access to those APIs. There is a trust element there that goes beyond the technical trust. It's into, are you an entity that can be trusted with access to banking information? Are you an entity that can be trusted with access to financial systems? But beyond that, there are also some, some technical challenges. Organizations will provide a sandbox environment to practice in, but sometimes the sandbox doesn't work the same as the APIs they've created. So you can build a solution based on a reliance on the specification and the sandbox and end up with something that doesn't work in production. And a lack of attention to those specifications or uh, a lack of mocking or use of tools that are out there to make it easier for people can lead everybody into those disagreements and those problems that happen. Um, and there's certainly lots of tools out there now that help that, um, Postman being the most obvious example. But it's essential to understand what you're getting into. And it also will help if we're more open about where you go to get the information you need about signing up and providing services on these APIs. It sometimes feels that while we've created open ecosystems, there is a feeling that the ecosystems are being created to benefit the larger players by making it cheaper for them to maintain their systems, while simultaneously trying to keep the wider value of lots of developers being able to build innovative solutions out. And we're very, I'm very much a fan of the idea of open ecosystems encourage new solutions, new, uh, new entrants, and new technologies to emerge. The next class of uh, trust problems uh, I call the precious problem. And it's a reliance internally inside providers on one particular tool or methodology that they really like or they've got a really big investment in. Um, it's fully, completely understandable. If you've invested hundreds of thousands of dollars or more in a, a tooling system and a monitoring system that tells you how everything works in your infrastructure, you really want to get your money's worth out of that, whether it's your API gateway or your application stack. But the thing is, you also need to have consistent measurement. If I go back to the error of parallax, you need to agree on what it is you're delivering with your suppliers. It's no use knowing that everything inside your stack worked if it's something outside of your stack that's causing the problem, or vice versa, it's no good to you if the problem is with your supplier and you can't see why they're having problems. They'll be upset, you'll be upset. The third problem in this line we see with regulated APIs is it doesn't help you from a branding perspective if something is outside of your chain of control or your chain of measurement. If you are relying on third party systems, um, for example, in open banking, you could easily be accepting or make creating payments in another provider or getting information such as transactions from another bank. 
nobody looking at your branded app is going to care that the problem is with someone else. All they're going to see is what they're looking at. And you can be blocked and you can have brand issues and market, market awareness issues based on that poor experiences outside of your control unless you know what those problems are and how they manifest themselves. So moving on from that, uh, I'm going to talk about some of the things that I think we should all do anyway um, that don't require any particular changes, just some refinements on how we do business in regulated environments and how we how we pay attention to that. And there's some things that we need to agree to do the same way. These are the things um, coming back to parallax and measurement and uh, the impl implementation of standards where in all honesty, we're not uh, doing ourselves any favors by not agreeing what we do before we go out and launch systems. So starting with the, the stuff we can all do. Um, obviously, use standard specifications and document what you do. There are lots of tools, tools and methodologies for that. The open API specification is, is an essential part of that. Tools like Postman, tools like Stoplight, and so on. Um, but decide what you're going to use. Make sure you use it and make sure the documentation is good ideally with lots of examples of how things work, showing how they work. And if you're doing sandboxes, make sure the sandbox and the development environment are as close to identical as possible. It's very noticeable in banking. The challenger banks, such as um, something like TrueLayer or banking as a platform like Rails Bank, are extremely good at having developer and sandbox environments that are practically the same in all respects as their development environment, uh, their production environment, whereas the larger banks and providers in the same ecosystem are not, where they, they'll skip security, they'll skip how far down into the information that they return in terms of dummy information they, they give you. So you could build against one sandbox and be very assured that it's going to give you what you want, but build against another one and it will be completely different and potentially not work in your uh, final application. Another step we can do is hire people who don't know your stack just to test it can be onboarded. The number of times we'll see that uh, organizations don't actually ever verify that their documentation or their onboarding is correct. There was a great article recently by uh, Joyce of Postman talking about one of the most important metrics in APIs being time to, time to first call. That can't be uh, overstressed enough. There are regulatory barriers. It can it can be difficult to get permission to access these, but you do need to verify that once somebody has access and has all of the pieces, they can actually go through the sequence of steps and validate it. And it's better to do that with someone who has no inherent understanding of your your systems versus using somebody who knows that step three can be skipped or the, the undocumented scope for a particular call is always the same. Um, Track those changes and recheck them regularly. Nothing ages worse than documentation. It's like house guests and old fish. It will start to stink sooner or stink sooner or later. And then measure from the places from the places your customers are. Um, there's lots of tools for that. Uh, API metrics, uh, Postman, Checkly, lots of others. But certainly measure from the perspective of external users. Don't over over rely on internal application stack monitoring or your gateway doing all of the work for you. The gateway is not the place where you should measure your performance. It's very tempting to measure it. It's used by a lot of companies in place of doing that, but it's not the right way to do it. So what does that actually leave out though? Um, the first one is agreement on what and how we measure. Um, obviously I'm biased because I come from a measurement company, but we should always measure in production. We should always measure from the outside in. And we should measure the same things in the same way so that when we talk to each other or when organizations talk to each other, they can be assured they're talking about the same things. Parties in dispute need to have organizations or entities or bodies outside the delivery chain to mediate that. It's very hard for regulators um, in financial services or healthcare to mediate a dispute between two parties where both sides essentially can tell, say the other is a liar and prove it. Um, they, they, the regulators, don't have the technical skill sets to actually broker who is at fault. And often when you start to dig into the technical issues at the heart of what the problem is, it can turn out neither side is technically at fault. The problem lies somewhere else. 
but both sides are assuming it's in somebody else's infrastructure. And then within the verticals, within the regulated environments, we need agreement and standards, um, non-technical standards on what is good or bad within that vertical. What, what are you trying to achieve? What do you expect from it? And from that, um, this is a small plug. I'll have a bigger plug at, my, at the end of my talk. Uh, I believe very strongly we need to start rating APIs in the same way that we rate financial services, that we rate banks, we rate cars, we rate movies. And the key things I think we need to have for that are independent standard setting, uh, standard setting for what we are rating. And it needs to be independent of the technology delivery systems. Uh, there's an expression in English about foxes guarding the hen house. Foxes would love to guard the hen house. They would not necessarily be the best person to do it. Exactly the same as your infrastructure technology vendors are probably not the people to ask whether your technology stack is working well. Their answer may be very different to uh, somebody who isn't doesn't have skin in the game for uh, technology delivery. And it probably should be separate to the regulators. The regulators are um, essentially policing something. There's a reason courts and judiciary and investigators are sometimes different to those courts. So um, those are the principles. And what we need to provide are guidance on the standard techniques for measurement. Um, I don't particularly mind who people use for external measurement, but there should be guidelines on how you do it and what you use it against. It's very com I've spoken to a lot of technical managers and a lot of regulated entities. And one of the issues they hit all the time is their internal management and internal risk groups won't let them monitor against production. If you're not monitoring against your production environment, you're not monitoring at all. And what they, they all say over and over again is if only there was a body that could, we could point to and say, this is the industry best practice, we must do this. And it would relieve a lot of the problems they have. We should have better practices for the documentation and service delivery sides. Um, it's, there, there are specifications, but how those specifications get documented and shown to individuals and to developers can vary enormously. And we need to have some agreement on what are the key things people should always show and how they should show them so that as, Postman say, as Joyce at Postman says, you can reduce that time to first call to as little as possible. And then finally, we need to have some form of dispute support. It's no good to have these constant circular fights between regulators and providers, between providers and trusted third parties, or even in many companies, just between customer success teams, engineering teams, and customers themselves. It, people need to be honest about where problems are and understand what the issues are before they get into a dispute that will not do their brand any good, will not do their business any good, and they may be on the wrong side of. And we're setting up an advisory body at the moment to try and answer some of these questions. Uh, we'll be announcing uh, some of the founding, uh, founding members of that organization next week, but they come from the security sector. They'll come from uh, API directory side of things. And uh, if you want to get involved and you're interested, please contact me. My contact details will be at the end. And as a bigger plug, uh, as I've just had my two minute warning, um, we do offer free and independent API performance metrics for people. You can check out API Expert. Uh, it's free for the headline data. There's a nominal fee for historical data, but it will give you some idea of what we're trying to achieve with API ratings. But uh, please feel free to reach out and ask me any questions about um, the API Ratings Agency and API technologies in general. So thank you very much for your attention. It's been a pleasure to uh, an honor to be invited to speak to you. And uh, I'll hand back to you, Mehdi. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, David. We have one minute, <laughs> only one minute to do to do that. So it seems you really assess the technical risk, the performance risk. Is the API rating agency you're building will also assess like some business risk, like, you know, closing API, being acquired, uh, you know, move, changing business models or, uh, or stuff like that? Absolutely. And I think it, the technical side is obviously what I'm very interested in from a business perspective. But I think for the success of uh, the regulate API ecosystems, we need to address some of these business needs. Um, Everybody thinks about what developers need, but developers aren't the only uh, recipients of API-based data. 
And we need to actually understand what we're delivering to whom and how. And part of my view of what we need to do with the API ratings is actually understand who all the stakeholders are and what they need for the ecosystems to be successful. Yep. That, that makes sense. That makes total sense. Thank you very much. We are exactly at 55, the exactly the time we had uh, allocated for this. It's really interesting. So we have to go on API.expert to know more, right? Yep, absolutely. Uh, that's uh, That's got uh, something like 2,000 APIs from 160 vendors. Our goal is to have curated collections of APIs people use all the time. We're not going to have every API in the world on there. Programmable Web has that, and so does Rapid API. We're just going to focus on the ones that people use all the time and worry about. Perfect. Thank you, David. Glad to Thank see uh, updates about it.